I can hear myself pretty good. I guess you guys can hear me too, right? All right, excellent. And so today I'm going to be talking about uh, different features that Package Source has. And I assume all of you uh, are familiar with either Package Source, uh, FreeBSD ports, or OpenBSD ports, or uh, some other packaging system like that. And so today my focus is on package source, but we'll talk about some things that might be different, or you'll, you'll see this different between the other package systems. Yeah. We're going to talk about its portability and some of its goals. Uh, one thing to note is package source is uh, maintained by NetBSD, but it is certainly not NetBSD specific, as we get uh, later on. Uh, I only list a few operating systems on here. Later slides uh, show a lot more. I should have at least listed uh, Mac OS 10, for example, or something on here, but uh, it's not official. Like these other ones, uh, uh, package source is a little more official. Uh, just to give you some background, uh, I've been using package source uh, for a long time, and it's how I became a NetBSD committer. I probably submitted uh, 50 plus uh, problem reports. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe 50 packages or so. Uh, and so then I was able to be invited to uh, commit right to the package source tree because I committed so much work. Uh, some of the work I've done with package source, uh, I did work uh, professionally for a medical research company. And uh, they had a variety of different software that there was no packages for. And so in their Mac OS was their platform. And so I just did work uh, porting a lot of their dependencies over to package source. And a lot of their software did not get put into the package source tree, but I had to make sure that all of their dependencies uh, worked correctly on a Mac OS platform for them. Uh, also, as a, a consultant, I did a lot of work with BSD OS. And basically, these systems were dying. But my customers had to keep on using them uh, because they had commercial software and they didn't have any uh, schedule to uh, migrate to a different platform. And so we used package source even for several years to continue to maintain the software on their system, uh, production software. Uh, also, package source, I packaged up everything <laughs> that was essential to a Linux distro, including the kernel, glibc. Uh, mod utils, uh, everything that wasn't in package source already, I, I did that uh, for Linux, and then I, I made a 100% buildable system using all package source. And uh, it was sort of fun, and it also helped me uh, see edge cases, I guess, in package source, uh, especially with installing uh, directly to slash user, for example, in trying to um, make sure that uh, software uh, didn't depend on the wrong things uh, as I built it. I've created hundreds of packages. And uh, I look into my package source new directory. That's where I s start my work. And I see, oh, man, I have like 150 packages in here. And uh, try to get those all pushed upstream. And I've maintained uh, certainly hundreds of others. I've touched certainly thousands of packages in one way or another. And also, um, providing bug fixes and improvements to upstream projects. Uh, if we make a change, and I'll talk about it later, but uh, surely share these with upstream developers. Uh, package Source for several years has had a weekly rotation. I've been slacking off a lot this last year, but, um, uh, but I've participated in that for several years. And basically, you watch PRs or problem reports that come in. And we do triage for them. If they're trivial, maybe we'll fix them ourselves. Or we'll ask another developer if they'll take that ticket. Or we'll give feedback for asking for more information. Or we'll automatically assign it to somebody. But uh, it, it's good uh, to do a little triage for the ticketing system. Uh, very quick intro. Of course, package source is two different things. Uh, it's a software build framework. Uh, it does many, many <laughs> things. But you know the very basics of uh, fetching and verifying what it fetched, uh, a, maybe a configure step, a build step, uh, uh, the installation and packaging step, and then install again. And you can see I have this uh, reverse package and install. Maybe we'll talk about that later. <laughs> it has to do with staging. 
Um, also, it's a software installation management system. Uh, installing, upgrading, uh, configuring software, removing packages in a consistent manner. Uh, package source does not have to be a, a, a build-only system. I have uh, several systems where I do not have a package source tree. I just use uh, the, the binary tools to install and maintain binary packages. And so uh, it's certainly doable. Uh, a quick history. Uh, so FreeBSD 1, uh, 1993, it included um, uh, some of the tar sets included source for many of the popular software. Uh, in 1995, those, those uh, source sets were put into uh, an infrastructure which they called ports. And you can see it's the same description as it is today. Go into the directory you wish to install, type mech, make, <laughs> and let the system do the rest. Uh, package source now uh, was forked in 1997. Uh, as you can see, this quote here. Maybe the person in this room said this quote. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but uh, try to keep things in sync with FreeBSD ports. But as you can imagine, uh, two different systems, uh, different goals, and it diverged. Uh, uh, this is uh, really interesting here. Uh, within a couple years, uh, ported to Solaris. Uh, very useful. And uh, then again, ported to Linux. And the bootstrap support uh, done uh, very shortly after, and then ported to the tree. And we'll talk about this. Um, uh, we'll have some slides right about it. But it's basically so you can get package source up and running on a different system like Solaris or Linux. All right. Uh, got cut off here, but. The, the gist of it, there's different ways to get package source. Uh, one way is you could check out the package source uh, via CVS. Or you could fetch a tarball, uh, whether it's bzip, gzip, or you can see uh, this one, xz. Uh, this tarball right here, uh, as of today, is around uh, 24 uh, megabytes. But I think I might be off. But when you extract it, I think it's around 700 or 750 megabytes. It's, it, it's a lot. Uh, what's extracted, of course, is the, the, all the specification files. But also, it has some source code also. And those are things that are key for bootstrapping. And then, of course, it also has the infrastructure. Um, make file snippets, for example. Now, let's talk about the bootstrapping. Uh, the bootstrapping is portable. Uh, there's shell scripts and make files for building and installing the dependencies in the packaging framework tools. Uh, this is portable, so we'd be able to use it on uh, various different operating systems. Uh, a few things that are key. It uses NetBSD's make, which is a, you know, a derivative of pmake. You cannot use FreeBSD's make um, or OpenBSD's make or Dragonfly's uh, make. Uh, just some slight differences. And also, it installs the package install suite, which is the low level commands like package delete, package info, package add. Uh, it may use the NetBSD compatibility shim. Uh, this is a library providing definitions and functions missing from other platforms. Uh, provides some like BSD isms that you might have lacking on a Linux box, for example. Uh, package install uses libarchive. You know, it can stream uh, different types of uh, archive formats. And so, and that's a portable project. And depending on your system, there might be a few other things that need to be bootstrapped. Uh, in, in a simple install script, uh, knock, uh, NetBSD's version of sed, and uh, uh, the public domain uh, K shell. It's because some systems might have a broken shell, for example. Or they might have an awk that's just incompatible, or a sed that's incompatible. So we could bootstrap uh, and get some of these included. Uh, there's other dependencies also, but they're not critical for the bootstrapping part. And they will be installed later on once you start uh, installing software. Uh, for example, digest uh, for uh, checking. Um, uh, the hashes for verification. Uh, TNFTP. Uh, by default, most of them need some way, you know, to fetch the software. 
So uh, NetBSD's FTP also has an HTTP client. And also some patch versions are broken. And <clears throat> yeah, hopefully I don't need water. And so NetBSD's version of patch. Uh, supporting NetBSD is not the major goal. And there is software in the package source tree that uh, is not ported to NetBSD and probably never will be. And so package source is a way to install a third party software. And in some cases, that software, uh, nobody in NetBSD wants to use it, but somebody that uses package source will want to use it. Oh, of course, uh, if it does uh, support NetBSD, then you should <laughs> make sure that it at least builds there and installs there. But it, it's not the major goal. Uh, many architectures, uh, multiple versions of operating systems. Uh, they might have different headers, of course, different system libraries, even different compilers and different build tools. And so um, we're not tied down uh, to many different things, and so that's pretty nice. So this is an important point. When we, have a, we need to port a software over, let's say to NetBSD, we're not going to first uh, specifically just patch it for NetBSD. We're going to abstract it. We're going to look at it from a bigger point of view. If it's looking for this feature, then we'll, we'll uh, work and make it patched for that feature. We're not going to patch it specifically for NetBSD. Or the same thing if we're porting it over to um, Darwin or Mac OS. We try to do it the most generic, a proper way, a way that we could share it to the upstream, and they can commit it to their upstream code without breaking their own software. I've seen other port systems where the patches are specific for their operating system. I'm not trying to pick on FreeBSD or OpenBSD, but very specific to them. They cannot share their patch upstream verbatim because it's specific to their operating system. So that's an important point. And so we share these patches back as much as we can. All right, platform supported. Uh, one thing to note is some of these platforms were done years ago. And it's possible that there's some people that don't use them anymore. Or if they use them, they're not updating their package source tree. They, they might be out of maintenance. Um, I could use BSDOS as an example there. I heavily used it, and, but I have not tested it. Uh, I've tested it this decade. I haven't tested it maybe two years or so. So reasonably recent. Uh, a few things to point out here. In fact, some operating systems I don't even know. Freemint, for example. But uh, Mac OS X, there is a package source developer that maintains binary packages for Mac OS X. And so, and, um, and hosted uh, via his company, I think, uh, Joyant. Um, some of these will use uh, package source right now as their main uh, third party software packaging system. Uh, for example, a Dragonfly. And so the list continues. Uh, Linux, that's sort of generic. But uh, I've used it on uh, CentOS, Red Hat, Debian. Um, I know others use it on Slackware. I've used it on a variety of different Linux systems. Uh, Minix 3, uh, package source, is sort of the, their main uh, suggested way to install third party software. Uh, also, uh, Joint provides uh, packages. Uh, uh, for uh, smart OS, I believe. But you can see right here uh, a lot of different platforms. And we can bootstrap and be able to install third party software easily on different systems. And so that's one of the main strengths. And it separates package source, as far as we know, from almost any other uh, packaging system. There's a few other package systems that um, have been made that work with FreeBSD and Linux and maybe Solaris, but they don't have such a huge team of developers um, maintaining them. And, um, and so package source truly is uh, uh, the most portable. Uh, we have a large number of packages working with the same code base. So you have a portable uniform operation over different systems. And so if you learn how to install the software in one system, the layout of how it's installed, the way the configurations are by default, um, how you're going to start and stop things might vary a little bit, but we do install the same um, like start stop scripts. And so it's a really portable uniform operation. Uh, also, you might have specific patches, for example. And so having those specific patches 
portable across all your systems also uh, as an admin. So I already mentioned some of that. And um, also the same things with the same build options uh, between different systems. Uh, one thing to note is uh, uh, with various configuration files, uh, by default, it puts these configuration files in examples directory. This is very useful for administrator, and you're going from system to system, be able to see the original suggested uh, configurations, which might be suggested by the package source maintainer, or they might be the suggestions directly from the mainstream. But we install those. Um, on installation, we don't overwrite the originals. And on D installation, it has a simple way to look at the examples version and if, it, if it's changed or not, you can know if it can remove your old configuration or not. And these things are a little bit tunable, and there's messages telling you about this. Yeah. Uh, just uh, over the next many slides, we'll just talk very briefly about many of the different features that Package Source has. And uh, it, it does so many different things, and, and most people don't use all the different features. Uh, where you can see the examples here, by default, where the configurations go. Uh, if you're running in unprivileged mode, which I'll talk about little later, it can go in your home directory like that, or user package etc. But you could change or you could tune where your configurations go. Maybe your um, site has a policy of where you need to install, or maybe because of your backups, or you have some reason. And so you could change it to install directly underneath the etc directory, for example, or, or under a subdirectory, etc pkg. Or if you need to get really fine-tuned for specific software, uh, if they have configurations, you could have a, a setting that you could set for every single software to go somewhere specific on your file system. So it's pretty um, fine-tuned that way also. Uh, of course, in these last two cases, you would need to rebuild and reinstall those packages after you made those changes. Uh, this is another awesome feature. And so as a user, as a sysadmin, and as a developer, there's many cases where the main Unix system, I cannot touch its, its standard packages. Maybe they're maintained by a different operator, or I don't want to break things for other developers. I mean, I, I can't upgrade their versions of their libraries uh, for the system. And so what I could do is I could do builds as a regular user and just dump them into my own home. This is very convenient. And so uh, first of all, the package source, in most cases, users and groups are very well abstracted uh, for different software. Um, and so package source can customize this. They can create these users and groups as needed. And because it's so well abstracted, you don't have to have many different users and groups. You could just use your own user account, your own group account. And so no, that's very nice. And you can see the bootstrap command it has a, a switch called unprivileged. And it, by default, it'll set the prefix so it'll all go underneath your home, under, underneath a directory called pkg. Uh, oh, a couple things to point out. So the first time you're bootstrapping, you have a big tarball to unextract. And then you bootstrap it. It takes a few minutes. And then you start installing software. The first times you're installing software, you might have many dependencies installed. And so yes, it's installing a lot of clutter <laughs> that you may not think you need. But after that, when you need to install something, it should be quick and simple, uh, uh, painless. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, multiple users on the same system could install their own packages. Hopefully your system's fast enough. Or not only that, with little tweaks, you could install multiple package source um, installs on your system in different locations also. I'm going to talk about that briefly later. Uh, this slide I should ignore, but uh, I uh, will have to say, I mean, there's problems in any system, and so we'll go through it quickly. Uh, it's huge, has many interdependencies. Uh, the point of this is, if you want to install one software, it might tie in with something else. And so I cannot download the, the structure for just one program, because I'll have to look at it. OK, it includes that one. I would have to download that one. It includes that one. I would have to download that one. So for now, we download the whole collection. And then, as I mentioned, uh, 700 megabytes uh, extracted. Uh, 
We use CVS. Uh, maybe it's not a problem. Uh, there's many developers uh, lately within the past two plus years that use Git with package source. They do their work uh, with Git. Uh, but the main tree that's maintained by NetBSD uh, uses CVS. And so if you need to do um, history or work, you have to have the network connection to the main server, for example. Um, the implementation, of course, the original FreeBSD implementation. <laughs> and so uh, we use a lot of shell, and we use make. And so sometimes uh, make and the shell put together like that can be inefficient. I, I would say it can be very slow. But in some cases, it's really quick. Uh, some packaging is redundant. Well, maybe you already use um, Perl tools or Ruby tools or something to install that software. Does it really make sense to install it again with my packaging system in a different location? That's something to think about. And we're, we work with different ways to make this clean, but still it can be redundant. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about this later. There's too many ways to choose from for doing software updates. Truly, we have like uh, over 25 different ways to upgrade your software. And so we have 25 NetBSD experts. They're going to do it 25 different ways. And that, that works for them. But when you have a new person coming in and they use yum or apt-get, we cannot tell them 25 different ways to do it. it it's a little bit uh, cumbersome. Uh, maybe this isn't a problem, but we support so many different platforms. And let's say uh, 10 versions of, of Linux or three versions of Solaris. We cannot provide uh, binary packages for all of these projects. We only provide binary packages for a few things. And then some developers, it's a side project, they might upload theirs. But I already mentioned um, some developers provide for Mac OS 10 and things like that. Uh, basic package source usage. This is just an example of a few steps to install some software if you're doing it as a regular user, doing it in your own home. And so you can imagine I did this on a Linux box. I got the wget, I downloaded it, I extract the tar, I extracted it. Uh, this tar was smart enough to understand the XZ format. Um, I go into the package source directory, I go into the bootstrap directory. Um, I ran Bootstrap unprivileged. Immediately it told me something about my shell. And so normally, as a hacker myself, I'd figure out, well, why didn't my shell work? But I followed the advice and just said, I'll use bin bash. And so I used the shell that it knew worked. Uh, it spun, it um, built some software, like I mentioned before, a make package install. Uh, it created a configuration file that will be used later on uh, by Make as it builds install software. And we'll look at that maybe a little bit later. But I, in my case, I just looked at it. It had some of the defaults. In, the, in this case, the defaults meant it was installing from my home, or in using my home. And so, yeah, I just jumped into a directory to build something. And I ran, I didn't, I didn't set my path yet, but you can see I'm using full path to be Make. And I did the install step, and then I played it. It's just a simple game. Um, and it had uh, various dependencies that pulled those in. So that, that's just a very basic example. And later on, of course, just like with FreeBSD ports or OpenBSD ports, just go into the directory and make install. Oh, one thing as a difference. By default, uh, we don't do a clean or a, like a clean depends. And so the, the source. <laughs> over time will fill up. You, you can uh, set a, a variable or make variable to clean or you can just put it on your command line, install clean, or you can do a make, uh, a make clean later. Oh, just to point out here, uh, uh, bmake is because it's the NetBSD's version. If you're on a NetBSD box, uh, you don't need to do a bootstrap. It already has a few dependencies already, so simply go into the directory and do a make install. The only thing is there, by default, it'll install to user package, PKG. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the root needs a little bit later. Uh, adjust your path, maybe adjust your man path. All right, as I mentioned, there's so many different methods. There's, I'm not going to talk about those today. There's too many. Yeah, and we'll talk about just some of the sort of the common ones. Uh, there's a target that will remove the package and all the packages that depend on it. 
It keeps a list of those, and then it attempts to rebuild all of those in that list. So we have a make update target. Um, and then there's a tool that sort of does the same type of thing, a tool to update all packages from sources. So two different ways to do the same thing. Oh, by the way, this package check tool is a third-party software, and so it's another software you can install to manage it. All right, another way, uh, make target replace. So if the package doesn't ex already exist, like a binary, a, a tarball for it, it will uh, tar it up. Generally, this is not a problem anymore. And then it uninstalls it. And then it builds and installs a new package. And then it fixes uh, metadata that depended on it. So it might update versions of what it depends on to depend on the new version instead. Uh, as you can imagine, this could be dangerous because <laughs> um, you might replace something that's slightly different, maybe has a different ABI or you know, various different things. And there's a wrapper around that. We'll look at your system to see what's out of date. Then, um, so there's a script that some people use that will make replace recursively and all those different things, and which can be dangerous too. Uh, just a note. I have some systems with uh, packages installed five, six, <laughs> maybe more years ago, and I just upgrade as needed. And so when I look on there, I still have old software installed with brand new software. And it's sort of a feature, maybe, because it's difficult. I'm a power user, I guess, and so I can understand how to fix things. Uh, the normal usage of somebody on any package system is when they do an upgrade you know, for a new version or they would upgrade quarterly or something, so they upgrade everything in tandem. Uh, keeping things around for many years is possible, though, with package source simply because uh, of some of its portable designs. Uh, binary package usage, and some of this you probably already know. You can do a package add with a URI, or you can do a package add directly to the file. And, or you could set the package path. Uh, variable here. Uh, in this one, you can't see it. The end of it ended with the all directory. And then you can do a package add, and it will attempt to figure out uh, the version there, assuming the, the server there is, supports those type of things. Um, we do not have like the minus R switch, but you would do it this way instead. Uh, one thing to note about this, I've done this uh, hundreds of times, maybe more over the past uh, 10 years. And so it's downloading the dependencies. If there's something that breaks in the middle, it, it can be tough to try to figure out what happened there uh, because um, it's just a single uh, low-level tool. And so, oh, I don't know what happened there. Oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> I'll talk about the next thing. I, I'm, I missed a slide here and some other ways for upgrading. And so the minus U switch will update a package in place, and then again, it'll fix meta, uh, the metadata for the other packages that, that depend on it. And then also, if you want to do a recursively update, uh, minus U, U, uh, to do the prerequisite packages also. And then uh, there's a script you could use to attempt to do the same thing. And when I say binary upgrading, this means that you're not building from source at all, upgrading with binary packages. Yes, yes, yeah. And so uh, another way to do it. Uh, if, if I teach this uh, lecture again, maybe in a couple, like a year or something, I probably might start mentioning the easier tools first. But in some cases, they still have little nuances. Just like in the free BSD world, you want to use a new tool, well, they don't even offer the packages <laughs> on their package servers You know, for some of their versions of free BSD. And so little things like that. All right, as I say. <laughs> uh, so some of the package source-based platforms, um, like uh, SmartOS or something, they suggest promote document the binary package use only. They don't tell you to download the package source tree. They don't tell you to use a package add tool. They tell you to use other higher level tools, uh, which we'll talk about. 
And so just quickly, we have a metadata, like a database containing a list of all the available packages. We call it the package summary database. And it's based on the same ideas as a Debian available database. And so it allows somebody to use that database to write tools to be able to recursively or you know, upgrade software, or install software, or search what's available. And so there's a few different tools that take advantage of the database. Um, one tool, I've, I just made a hack tool. I'm one of the people that made the summary database, so I wrote a, a bunch of shell scripts, maybe set or awk, to uh, use the database so I can install software. And then two other tools that were created, um, PackageIn is this one, and then another one is uh, PKGNIH, not invented here, uh, which I, I don't have slides on that. Uh, so PackageIn, as you can see, aimed at being an apt or yum-like tool. And so, um, App get, update, app get, install, you know, uh, simple things. Uh, and so it has some of the same functionality. We won't go through all these features. Uh, but you can see what's available on your, oh, I'm sorry, what's already installed on your system and what's available. Um, do an install. The install target also, or the option there also can do upgrades. You can do an update, uh, downloading what's available. Uh, sort of the app get way. So app get, you would update to get the available database, then you do your installs. Where the default for yum is a little bit different, where it will check for the updates uh, as you use it. And so you, you can see the bottom one, you can search for packages and so on. And a few other uh, switches also to get more information about what's available. And I can give you some examples. And so, as I mentioned, some systems I use, I only use PackageIn. And um, I help maintain different systems for developers. And, um, oh yeah, I should back up a little bit. So some of my package source work, I didn't mention all the different platforms I use it on. Um, but I, I run a build farm uh, for ISC for different bind products. And so we have many different systems where their native package collections do not provide the tools that we need. And so when I need the certain tools, um, there was a quote from the earlier thing, uh, earlier presentation today, make everything standards, standardized, don't do a one-off. <laughs> so if I'm gonna learn how to install a third-party software, then, heck, I'm going to document my steps so I could redo it again. And if I'm going to re reuse on another software, I'm going to follow those steps and do it again. So might as well document it in a package source uh, uh, specification, that type of way. So anyways, uh, back to package in here. So I see I have 50 softwares and uh, packages installed. Um, the collection available, uh, 11,000 from this one. And my configuration, it points to the URL where it has the package summary file, and it also has where the binary package uh, tarballs are. And so you can see this example here. Uh, do an update, grabs a new uh, summary database, updating the database. And then I had the next example here is searching. Uh, you can see here that it says, a newer version is available. You can see that with the less than sign. And so that's a, that's a candidate for an upgrade. And you can see now when I've done that package in update, I have 200 more packages available uh, from the previous time. And uh, another simple example, uh, installing Git host. Uh, this one didn't have any dependencies. And so it was very trivial and uh, there is a switch in a way you don't have to get prompted. You can turn that prompting off. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but you can do a uh, package in, install something with dependencies, and it'll simply give you a list of everything it wants to install, and you've probably seen the same thing on other package systems, and then you can say yes or no, and then it'll let it do its thing. Um, also, it'll mention that it wants to upgrade. Let's say it wants to do download, fetch, install 20 items, but it wants to upgrade five things. It'll, it'll tell you that also. Uh, 
Oh, <laughs> just one more example. I upgraded the software itself. Uh, package in, install package in. Of course, it's already installed because I'm using it. But you can see uh, it did an upgrade. Um, it, this is a little bit cluttered, as you can imagine. It gives you the removal messages. Then a moment later, it's going to give me the uh, messages that it installed again. Uh, uh, one thing to note, we won't look at it, but it might have warnings or errors that you detected in the lower level tools, and it'll log those into a file, and you can look at those things. Uh, why does it say updating database? That's one thing to point out. Uh, the main metadata for packages are just text files. You know, various different text files meaning different things. And so in this case, uh, packagein uses SQLite. And so it puts it into a database that it works with a little bit quicker and a little bit easier. All right, going on to a different topic here. Uh, work in progress. Uh, the WIP, package source WIP, it's at SourceForge. It's very useful for, even for me, if I'm packaging up a bunch of stuff, but I cannot get it finished, or I just can't get it ported correctly to NetBSD or something that I want to test it on first, well, I'll just dump it into, um, into their tree. I could share it with others, and that way they could fix it, or um, they can provide feedback. It's much simpler to point someone to a, a near completed package versus trying to send some emails, copy and pasting snippets when I could point them to something that's um, almost ready to use. And so you don't need to be a NetBSD committer. Uh, you just need to, um, of course, have a SourceForge account, then get uh, permission from the maintainer of that project. So it's very useful for learning. Is there a separate joint package source for uh, Package source for joint. I don't think so. They do have their own Git repo. They would have some of their um, things that haven't been pushed into package source proper. But for work in progress, I, I don't know. Yeah. And so this is for beginners and for advanced users. Uh, many times I do not use it, though. If I make a package, I do it correctly. I'll just push it directly into the package source tree. Uh, may contain broken or unmaintained packages. I don't know how many packages are in it right now, but I assume it's around 700 to 1,200, somewhere in that area. Uh, some of them broken are probably my packages. They might be anybody's. If, if I made a package and never completed it you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> it may continue to be broken. All right, another cool feature, uh, cross-compilation. Uh, this is, some of parts of it are old, but some parts of it are new. We'll talk about this. So package source is already abstracted for different compilers. And we use a wrapper framework to try to uh, reorder switches and use compilers in different ways. And you can see all the different compiler um, systems that we've supported at one time or another, and some of them we still support. It's a big list. And as you can imagine, uh, GCC, even the command line usage of it is different than maybe an HPUX uh, compiler. And so, some things are generic, and you know they um, go across. But some software um, isn't portable. Let's say they don't use autoconf, and so right here, package source wrappers can help work around problems like that. And so we're already abstracted for these type of things. But now, if you want to do embedded work, you might use discc or emulators. But here's another way: is it's possible to be able to use package source to create um, uh, pack packages for a different, uh, well, for right now, for NetBSD proper. And this, going back a few years ago, the initial goal was just to get the bootstrap tools to be cross-compilable on NetBSD. And then uh, the big, bigger goal is for Xorg, X11 suite, and, and its dependencies be cross-compilable. But uh, recent work has also added additional NetBSD cross-compile support. So this is a big new feature. And now there's patches uh, in progress or work in progress for doing cross-builds for different platforms. This is going to be a lot of work. And as you can imagine, uh, using a Mac OS host, that's your quick uh, box, to generate embedded uh, Linux packages could be very, very nice for a lot of people. Um, it's very significant. For package source, it's abstracted so much, it, sh 
it will be an easier place to do it than probably any other packaging system. Um, and then uh, the benefit for package source will, it'll help bring out different issues to even make package source better as we do that. And so that'll be really nice. Uh, we have a lot of documentation. We have a guide, a package source guide. It's uh, getting very lengthy. It's getting longer and longer. Uh, it's in HTML. I think it's in PDF. And uh, I look at the text file uh, very frequently. Uh, we have a full suite of ma uh, man pages also, package, uh, add, info, delete, uh, package install.conf, which I'll maybe mention a little bit later. And then there's uh, various uh, wiki pages where people have put tutorials or uh, how to different steps. Uh, but this next thing is sort of interesting. It's not complete, but it, it's a good start. So we have uh, a, a variety of uh, make files or snippets for including into make files. And they might have different things that can be explained. And so we have a make help target. We can say the topic. And it can give you information about how to use, maybe how to use another target or how to use a uh, make variable. And so it's sort of a built-in uh, help. And so that's pretty nice. All right. So the next thing is another uh, awesome feature of uh, package source uh, build linking. And uh, we'll get into detail here. But one thing to note is there's a big overhead. And I do some work with Debian packaging at work. And, and but there's other systems. They're, they're key for making packages. They want to make a clean package. They don't want it to depend on something accidentally that was already installed on your system. Let's say you had libxml installed. And for some reason, some software you had picked that up. And then you install your package on another system. It won't run because you don't have libxml. And so the common way to do this is to do it in a true environment. But the overhead is big, because you've got to install every, all those dependencies. And then when you're done, you need to clean out that entire environment. The overhead could be pretty significant. So package source is a simpler mechanism. OK, maybe it's not simpler. <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's a lighter mechanism. So we have various makefile rules to define the dependencies. The dependencies could be very wide, uh, headers, libraries, uh, there may be package config uh, specifications. They might be. Uh, um, libtool archive files, uh, just a variety of different things. Um, the package builder may also choose to use some dependencies you already have on your system. Let's say you have OpenSSL. Let's say you have uh, XFree86. You have some type of dependency, and you don't want to use a package source equivalent. Uh, these are called built-ins. And sometimes it auto detects. And depending on the system, we have some preset defaults of whether, you, whether or not you may use a built-in. Oh, we do not provide built-ins for everything. Like We don't want to provide a built-in for Python 3 or um, Perl, for example. We will use a package uh, source uh, version of those. Just be simply because some things are too big. And trying to manage them from a, from a built-in perspective uh, might be very difficult. All right, so it knows what it needs to do a build. So then it creates a symlink tree of all of these specific files, like I mentioned above, headers or libraries or libtool archive files. The symlink tree could be extremely huge. <laughs> if you're installing, uh, let's say, something that uses uh, 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 Qt, for example, in all of its dependencies, you might have uh, layers and layers of dependencies, a, a big symlink tree. Um, the next thing is the execute path is overridden to use the wrapper scripts. Also, we um, set various configure variables or make environment variables. The whole goal is to override different settings used by the compilers or the configuration tools that configure the environment. And then it will point to directly where we have that symlink tree, the build link tree. Uh, we might, we'll override those for many different phases of part of the build and the installation. And as I mentioned earlier about abstracting for compilers, well, we might also do other abstraction here. And as I had mentioned, this has helped to have a very consistent build. 
prevents the software on the system already installed from uh, being used for creating a new package, even if it's installed from package source. Even if it's in user package lib or user package include where it would look by default. And uh, I had mentioned before that I created a Linux distro. And so that, that was a little bit tricky because you have user include, which is uh, set by default. But um, our build link tree uh, did help a little bit in that case. And uh, there's so many different examples, but I just showed a couple things about what's built in. And so, okay, on this Linux box, it detected that it'll use a built-in uh, pthreads. It detected it'll use a built-in OpenSSL. But um, for some reason, maybe I didn't have the uh, readline dev package installed or something. I'm, I'm not sure because I didn't look into it. But um, in this case, it's going to use the package source version. And I already mentioned how it, it sets different things, but it might uh, override or set different environment variables or configure flags to use the versions that it specifically, specifically depended on. All right, so you could see an example, a short example of, a, of the build link, uh, symlink tree. Okay, not all of them are symlinks, and so I, I sort of use the wrong name. In some cases, we dynamically generate uh, PC files. Uh, I don't know if we dynamically generate lib archive files, but we might. But uh, we put the files in place that would properly point to our versions that we specifically depend on. Uh, so sometimes I just cat these files. It will give a list of the things that were build linked. Uh, build linking and X11. And so at one time I had packaged XFree86. Somebody else had packaged XFree86. And then um, myself and a couple people, we packaged up uh, Xorg. And then we got rid of that because then we packaged, it was a modular version. So we went through multiple phases of that. And so, but also we support uh, other implementations of X. And I'm not sure how many of these are actively used today. But uh, we provide another package that provides a symlink tree that'll point to those. That way we could uh, point to the X11 components that they need. Uh, today, um, most platforms, well, maybe not most, many platforms will default to modular. Uh, one thing to note, a NetBSD itself will, um, by default, will use native. But uh, modular is broken into many, many, many packages. And I just listed a short list here. Uh, these are some of the very core ones. I would assume they're all dependencies of libxl. libx11. Uh, let, let me uh, pause here for a second. Anybody have any questions about the build linking? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but I can imagine. Um, so some of the build link um, include files also have an associated built-in file. And in some cases, the built-in file might have auto-detected your system wrongly. And so, yes, we might have a variable. We can override it. But um, it really depends on the specific package. Um, one problem is, is if you have a slightly older version of like free, free desktop version of the lib XL, lib uh, X11 versus the, the newer versions, uh, some of them are missing um, package config files or lib tool archive files. And so it might break in subtle ways. But if you have something specific, <laughs> you could email me. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, another thing is we do have an options framework. Uh, FreeBSD has something similar. Uh, FreeBSDs by default is interactive. You know, you, you do an install, you come back an hour later. <laughs> Dang, I, I got to click these check boxes. And yes, you can install or manually set those ahead of time or have it use the defaults. But um, 
LeastNet BSDs is not interactive in this case. Uh, you could view them, make show options target. It'll list uh, the general options it has. It'll tell you what's enabled by default. And also, it'll tell you what's currently uh, enabled, just in case you have configured that somewhere. Uh, they should, yes. If they don't, then complain to us. We do um, have a file that has a description for, for most of them. And some of the descriptions might be vague, but they should have a few word descriptions for each one. Uh, I should show more examples here. But uh, you could do a site-wide settings with pa package default options. Um, could be a whole list, uh, space separated, so just put quotes around it. Or it might do one specific for a a certain package like exam. The thing that's tricky for new users, if you want to turn off something, uh, put a minus sign in front of it, like uh, dash like attack there, and so you could turn off. And so these are actual real examples of something that I would use. For example, I'm not using the, the GUI with Git. Uh, OK, uh, options just to back up. So our framework right now, as is, does not generate a different package when you tune the package options. And so that means you might have different packages that are different, even though they're named identical the same. Uh, there are some developers who have their own uh, build systems that will that name the packages based on the options that you choose. But you can imagine, you might have 50 options. And to have a package name with 50 options following it, <laughs> and even you know the tar file name, it, it can be pretty cluttered and confusing as is. I mean, you're looking at it and go, oh man, that's the longest package name I've ever read. And that won't help you either. It might help you with if you only had one or two options. Uh, staged installs. We've had this for at least a couple years. It's been default for over a year. Uh, basically, what this is is in installs uh, to a temporary staging directory. And so it installs the entire thing to a staging directory. Um, I think 99% of our software now supports this. And so it is the default. Go in staging directory so it can uh, check to make sure it's consistent. And then also, one cool thing about this is then you could create a package without installing it on your system. And so it can be a nice feature there. As I mentioned there. Uh, another interesting feature. And, and so many of our packages define the licenses that are supported. And you can see this list of default acceptable licenses. And uh, somehow I have two different slides merged together, sorry. <laughs> but anyways, um, we have different tools and different things. And so you can define the licenses that you want to support. They could be defined for the package binary tools or defined if you're building from package source. This is really cool because you could um, be restrictive or be more open depending on your developer or your production environment rules. And so this can be helpful. So I'm not sure if I'm supposed to end uh, at an exact time, but my lecture ends, at the time allotted it ends in five minutes. So let me know if I need to end right now or, or something. But um, this slide right here is, oh, sorry, it's the next slide. So just basic packaging steps. I was going to show some live examples. There's many, many different ways to do it. But as I mentioned, I, when I install software, I don't want to do it one off. And so I create uh, a step. And there are tools or there's um, templates that you may use. Uh, one tool is called URL to package, and it works for probably over 50% of uh, simple projects. And I've used it hundreds and hundreds of times. <laughs> and so it'll you basically point it towards the tarball. It'll download it. It'll, it'll open up this tarball and look at it and see if it can get a general gist of how it should be configured and built and installed. And so if things that use autoconf, you can imagine it could do a, 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 good, a, a good basic uh, job. But other things you might have is a simple step. So uh, if you do the make some target, once you've already set something up, it'll download it and create your uh, checksums. Another target that I use often is print plist. And it'll, def it'll generate your packing list. And so a list of the files and the directories and the directories that should be removed at deinstallation time and, and so on. Uh, another target that's usable, useful is a show var. 
And so if you want to look at a variable as it's uh, changed, as it goes through um, the different makefile snippets, you could see what its uh, setting is at that time. And so um, I, th I think one of the slides got messed up there, the package lint slide. So I'll just mention it very quickly. And so package lint is a tool basically for looking at the sanity of a package. Some developers don't like it at all. I love it. Uh, it gives you so many different hints of, oh, you missed this. Uh, maybe you could do this a better way. It has so many different hints to packaging. It's, it seems very useful to me. Uh, one thing to know for packaging, packages should never touch the final configuration file. They should not install directly to your ETC directory. I had mentioned that before. They should install to the user share, or sorry, but anyways, the examples directory. But um, there's a few um, variables you would set, and you would need to make sure that your software uses it from the ETC directory, and not from the examples directory. But that's uh, just a little hint or a tip about that. Um, it's not always true, but many times you use the build link infrastructure for the library dependencies. And as uh, creating new packages, well, of course, we have 11,000, 12,000, maybe 13,000. There's many examples. And there's a very helpful audience. I have to mention, the reason I went to NetBSD in the first place, and I use other BSDs for other work, is um, the environment of the package source developers and NetBSD developers in general were so friendly, so helpful. If I asked them a stupid question, uh, they're, they would just prompt me, prompt me, prompt me, and help me um, be able to solve a problem. And yes, that can be slow, but it is a very friendly group. And so that was very helpful for me. And so as I mentioned, uh, we, the helpful group, there are mailing lists. Um, don't abuse it by being stupid on purpose, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, there's very friendly. And so I'm going to skip the packaging example and just um, is somebody else presenting in here right now? I don't think so. This should be the last one, maybe. Oh, okay, okay. And I have one minute, or is it, I can't tell. Okay. Um, we've had a vulnerabilities database for basically 13 years. And so um, it's a way to, you could have automated, so when you want to build a package, you'll check the database and say, okay, this is vulnerable. And you can set some um, variables to say, OK, I'll ignore that. Or you could also have an audit tool that runs nightly or however you need to um, give you a report. Um, I don't have it listed here, but I, there's thousands and thousands of entries in there. And so it's a pretty, uh, it, it's maintained pretty well, and it's uh, growing all the time. So it's nice to have a vulnerability database. Oh, um, I think there was an old package for uh, converting a FreeBSD port to package source. I don't think it's been maintained for many years. It, it might do a little bit of the job. Uh, I don't know of any others. Uh, as I mentioned, there's thousands of vulnerabilities listed. Uh, digital signatures, just to point out, we've had signed package support since 2001. Uh, I don't think very many people are using it. But um, it, it's a nice feature, and it's a part of our package infrastructure to be able to have signed uh, packages. I mean, that's very useful. Uh, another thing, very quickly, we've done quarterly stable branches uh, since 2003. I didn't, I didn't realize it, but that's, I mean, that's a long time. And so we provide another branch, and we just pull up bug fixes. And so if you want to have a stable environment, and you don't want to go with the bleeding edge package source, you can stay with the stable branch. So that's another nice feature. And so, yeah, 50th stable branches. That's, that's phenomenal. Uh, just the idea of the package counts. Yes, we don't have as many packages as some. And the how you count packages, you know, varies because uh, we don't break a software up into 10 components. And so these are, uh, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good amount. It's, in fact, it's very good. And you can see some of the counts for different platforms. There is so much more to talk about. And so this slide, I won't talk about them. But you can see, I have many. 
Um, I am finished. I appreciate you coming and listening and learning more about Package Source. Feel free to ask me questions about any any time. You could probably ask Al or <laughs> others. And I should personally thank you for <laughs> for the work you've done. Also, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people. Um, does anybody have any questions? Lots of questions. Okay. <laughs>